Hello, hello out there, boys and girls. It's your infinite bestie, Jesse Dram, uh, coming back for the I Hate Infinite Jess podcast, number 22. This is pages 620 and 651. Then this is with Adam Conrad, comedian Adam Conrad. He reads out, Conrad, Conrad, not a pinko. Okay. Um, you can check him out online at... On Instagram, at Spooky Dudes. That is Spooky, D-O-O-D-S. He has a Twitter account called at Minfinite Jest. So it's Infinite Jest, only starting with an M. It is Infinite Jest told a sentence at a time as expressed by Minions memes. That would be Despicable Me. That's pretty interesting on there. He has a project called Front Row Film Roast, which I think you guys should check out. They have coming up. Uh, they're going to be doing a roast of the film Scream. He described it as mystery science theater only for movies you actually like. But that's going to be Saturday, October 24th at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Looks really interesting. Yeah, so since you guys have heard me last, I am a year older on... Uh, yeah, last week I celebrated my 34th birthday. I mean, I know it was 34th, but now that I'm thinking now, like, I think I did actually mention this last time, and I just never got into it, because my birthday was on a Saturday. Ah, I remember what happened. My birthday was on a Saturday, and because of that, me and Robin recorded an episode a bit earlier on Thursday. That's what happened there. Yeah, it's been a, it's been an interesting week, I guess. I'm still terribly unemployed I'm, I'm actually trying to I'm, I'm still applying to work so we'll see what happens this is a really interesting horrible time for american politics is anybody else fighting online all the time constantly like i am i'm i'm trying to work on a bit right now i mentioned the star wars bit last week which some people actually i had a few people compliment me on that this week but I'm trying to work on a whole suite of jokes that's really about delusion and how people look at themselves. And one of the things I keep throwing out on Facebook whenever I see one of these like hardcore right supporters is they seem to be like, you know, yeah, 1776 founding principles, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm really just trying to get across like you guys realize you would 100 percent be sucking King George's dick. It is reset. 1776, you would have 100 Ben Franklin, oh, that Antifa terrorist, that's who you're siding with? No, uh I got I got to stick with loyalty like a true American, the mad King George III. That's my guy. That's, that's who I'm supporting. I think the rest of them ought to be hung. Like, at what point in their brains do they not realize that, like, they're sticking up for a tyrant? I don't know. I don't think I should be talking about any of this. Uh, um, I need to give a special shout out to uh, a user named Caleb Tripp. Caleb's a big fan of the show. He reached out. He actually asked if he could like contribute in any way, which is something I hadn't considered. He he wanted to do it via Patreon, but it's like I don't. <sighs> Realistically, this is going to change with uh, what happens with the podcast after Infinite Jest with the idea I have. I think I'm going to bring some people on to help with that. But as of right now, like as far as Patreon, um, I'm just I'm producing as much content as I can psychologically handle right now, just because it's a one man operation. It's it's just me here, uh, aside from whoever the guest is. I'm trying to get some other things off the ground. Like, I I don't know how anybody else is. I, I am a, in a weird thing where I work best on my own. Yet, at the same time, I kind of need... I like having a partner just so I'm not carrying the whole fucking boatload. And it's really not a good mix, I'll be honest. A lot of times, the kind of people I've tried to partner up with were had half the talent and then were just as lazy as me. And that sounds like an insult, and that's because it is. But the point is, it's very easy to kneecap yourself. So if you're ever wondering why I don't have a Patreon, it's just 
I can't imagine putting more work into this. Unless it was like a straight re it, it really takes more prep time than you would think just to read and take the notes down for this show. It really does. So usually by the end of like my my busy my busy days are Sunday to Wednesday because Sunday I record the podcast. Uh, so later tonight is when I'll edit everything. Sunday today is when everything gets edited together. It goes up Monday all day. Monday I'm promoting the podcast. Monday and Tuesday night I am reading. I'm taking copious notes. Usually I'm trying to book ahead for the coming weeks. Wednesday night into Thursday, I completely fucked myself writing that blog for All Elite Wrestling, uh, about All Elite Wrestling, because usually I've never watched the show live even once. I come home, I watch whatever illegal YouTube upload has come up, and I just knock out 3,000 words on fucking dudes fighting in their underwear. And then, you know, so with that time left over, and again, this is me unemployed. It, me employed, I don't know what the fuck I'd be doing. So, yeah, so then from just, like, Thursday to Saturday, I just don't want to do anything. But long and short, uh, God, th this feels weird putting out there, but I was actually really touched that this guy cared enough. Um, I'm on Venmo, at Jesse Dram, just that, J-E-S-S-E-D-R-A-H-A-M. Uh, if you guys ever want to send me anything... Hey, I appreciate it. Send me art and shit, too. I haven't gotten emails in the last few weeks, and that kind of bums me out. I like hearing from you guys. Uh, somebody named Tyler messaged me just how much he liked the show, and then he randomly got in a discussion of rock and roll and what killed it, and I ended up writing. <laughs> like I ended up writing for a half hour. I, I, I think even he was like, okay, bud, that's okay, because he hasn't gotten back. <laughs> shout out Tyler yeah that was pretty cool man I, I like getting into that discussion rock and roll was killed by Kurt Cobain he made rock and roll whiny they if anybody asks you taking the sex out of rock and roll is what killed rock and roll yes we had a few more teen years but like when you have 10 years of Linkin Park as the biggest rock band and every song is like you know you were disappointed in me and you're a jerk, but I'm a big badass now, and fuck you, dad. Like, dude, grow the fuck. You're, uh eh. It's been retconned a little bit by him killing himself. Hey, look, it does tie into it, into into the podcast. It's been retconned a little bit, but it's like, dude, grow the fuck up. Get, o get over yourself and your dad. Like there was a weird era of like new metal. I remember Stained was the big one because there was literally one song by Stained where at different points in the song it was uh, you don't like Dad, you don't pay enough attention to me, and then literally the next line is Leave me alone, you don't understand me, and like this is a grown man with a mortgage and a wife and children writing fucking sadness porn for 12 year olds and i i think it was irresponsible i'm pissed off about it in retrospect like that was uh, fuck fuck aaron lewis fuck stained um yeah so venmo me stuff email me i don't know it feels weird uh, ah. this is just one of those things with art in general and i can say comedy as well but i guess this is any kind of thing you're so desperate for recognition like right now, I'm having trouble getting booked around the city just because there's there's this extreme lack of shows, and it's just the same five people getting booked left and right. I I won't get back into it from last week, but it's you struggle so hard just to get noticed that like when somebody reaches out and's like, "Hey, you are making my life a little bit better, and I would like to compensate you for that," and you know, I'm I I I'm reacting like you know somebody's trying to give me a kidney. It's like no, oh god, no! I couldn't. Are you are you serious? I mean, I'll 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 take a kidney. I didn't think I really needed one, but it's a, no, 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 no. I t I'm I'm a bad person making a bad thing, and you're making a bad decision trying to give me money. There's a self hate built into it where you feel bad accepting anything for your work. Despite the, how, even though the ultimate end goal, really as any kind of artist, your hope is like, no, I don't want anyone to give me a dollar until a millionaire gives me all of his dollars. That's, or, or, or a good chunk. God, I really went off the rails this week. I'm sorry. There's no song this week. The only thing, I think the, the theme song will probably just be the MASH song, which I just don't know that song well enough to write a cover. And, um, uh, 
I'll keep the songs coming. Guys, we only got like 10 episodes left of this thing. It's, I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do with myself. I'm going to, we're going to have like a big round table, probably just gigantically long episode, or maybe I'll break it up into a few things where we just discuss the themes and the theories. And, uh, the idea after that, I'm very excited for, especially because I think I'm going to bring on a co-host so I don't have to do all of the work anymore. And that co-host will probably be Neil Wood, formerly of Nerds with Words podcast. You might remember him from episode, uh, I mean, footnote episode two, Consider the Lobster. He's a good buddy of mine. Me and him went and did a show in Levittown last night and fucking crushed. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, he's been my podcast. He was my, I did my first podcast with him, the Magical Misery Tour, which I think you should go check out. It's pretty cool. Um, trying to think, yeah, the, the only two people even slightly famous I ever had on there—they're not famous, but in comedy terms, uh, Ryan Shaner and Brian Six. If you're familiar with the You Fucked It podcast, they're on there, and uh, it was really, yeah, really good. I remember Shaner was a great episode because. A, a famously like very tough very masculine guy and we got him really drunk and he started crying it's a great episode check it out magical Mis- i'm paying for it to stay up why not I'm trying to get brian six on for an episode anyway i don't know send me money even though it makes me feel bad maybe <laughs> uh oh yeah I'll, I'll probably bring neil on for the extension podcast because i like having him as a co-host he has better equipment than me also, he's the guy. Me and him are trying to go in and uh, make some sketches. So keep an eye out for sketches on Mr. Jessico on YouTube. Follow me at Jesse Dram on Instagram and Twitter. Don't look too much at Twitter. I've been a little political lately, and I don't want to. I don't want to turn anybody off from my podcast, despite the fact that I'm 100 percent right, and they'd be idiots to turn it off. I feel like I'm not funny or entertaining at all this week. I'm just gonna stop this. At Jesse Dram on all the things. At Diamond Joe Quim on Reddit. I'm not even going to say the line. I'm not trying to be dirty. It's just too many characters. Um, again, Adam Conrad. Follow him on all the things. Spooky Dudes on Instagram. Front Row Film Roast. I keep forgetting the fucking name. Point is, it's great. Go check it out. Go check out all his things. Here it is. Episode 22. Bye. Episode 22, I Hate Infinite Jest Podcast, pages 620 to 651. My guest today, coming coming from across the time zones, Adam Conrad. How you doing, buddy? Good, good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, hey, thanks for reaching out and uh, coming on. So, yeah, before yeah. we get uh, too far into it, tell us what you're doing. And, uh, sorry, I have a cat in the office with me for the first time, and she is destroying everything. So. <laughs> I may have some of that with my cat. He's been a little needy this morning, so he may come into play here. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe we can get our cats on screen and they can give their thoughts on this wonderful yeah. <laughs> piece of work. But yeah, I'm sure so, he's got lots of them. So what are you doing? Where can we find you? Social media, the whole bit. Yeah, so I'm in, uh, I'm in Salt Lake City. Uh, I'm a comedian here. I do improv and stand-up, though I haven't done stand-up in a while. Uh, I, uh, the things I want to plug uh, for this are um, I, I, with a few other uh, comedians, we do a thing called Front Row Film Roast. Uh, and it's basically think of like Mystery Science Theater 3000, but, you know, uh, movies people like typically rather than old B movies. Uh, so we're roasting Scream this uh, Saturday, not this Saturday, Saturday, October 24th. Uh, and you can check, you can just check their Facebook Front Row Film Roast on Facebook and uh, the events there it's a free thing so you just get a zoom link and you can be part of the audience um and then i'll also plug my instagram which i started drawing again my instagram's all drawings it's at spooky dudes dudes spelled d-o-o-d-s uh, and i just do little one panel things that are silly so nice okay so uh yeah check out spooky dudes hmm. I'm, oh, I'm yeah. Very, so yeah <laughs> what, what what is the comedy scene like out there particularly like so here in Philly, they've started a lot of, uh, and guys, don't worry, I'm not going to talk about stand-up too long. I know you guys don't care about anything <laughs> but your precious goddamn book. Um, <laughs> but yeah, in Philly, it's been, uh, there's been a few outdoor things 
down in Delaware, they just haven't cared this whole time and started indoor right away. But um, we're, all, we're all a little bit dreading winter because we realize it's probably going to come to a point where you either risk going inside or just don't do comedy. Yeah. Yeah. So here, um, I mean, in general, it's a, I think it's actually a really interesting, cool little scene. There's a lot of really funny people that I would, you know, put up against like the major market comics any day. For well, sure. Okay. Give me, uh, give me, give me two Salt Lake uh, comics I should look up in addition to yourself. Who would you recommend? Oh my God. Um, let's see. So no pressure just might make or break somebody's. I mean, career. it's not necessarily people who are famous yet or in any way, but no, 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 uh, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm talking under, I'm talking underground. You're, you're the popular kid coming from CBGB's. I want you to tell me who's tearing it up there at one o'clock in the morning <laughs> that I'm going to know about in a year. Who is tearing it up here? Uh, I mean, one guy's kind of made it out. He's in New York now. Um, uh, I don't really know him very well, but this guy named Shane Smith, he kind of blew up. Uh, there's a thing here called dry bar comedy and uh they um they do it's it's clean comedy i don't think he's not a clean comic but he did a clean set for this and a lot of his clips got online and he's uh he's doing pretty well um uh he's out in new york now um there's some guy uh alex valuto jordan macon are kind of bigger names locally um uh some of my favorites aren't kind of big yet but they're friends of mine of course uh but uh one of my favorites here is this guy nicholas don smith and he's uh just morbid uh nice. storyteller type uh very funny disgusting person in a good way <laughs> uh and very counter to the typical kind of salt lake clean comedy thing like most people here actually aren't clean comics but that's you know a lot of comics have to do clean sets to get work here because of the you know the mormon population and, and corporate gigs that you might get here so right and also we we know from being in the industry but even the term clean comedy is it's it's less a hundred percent clean and more like don't don't just rely on cursing which is something a lot of lazy yeah. comics tend to do. i've had a lot of places where they've said you know just try to keep it clean up there and then the host who told you that goes up and is just being filthy but yeah knows, but knows what he's doing yeah but i also think and this is weird because it's my wife but i think she she is uh she's gonna be someone to look at she's been she's been plugging away online comedy this whole time rachel rothenberg is her name and she's been getting better and better in quarantine without doing live shows and i think uh I think she's kind of coming into her voice and, and getting her stuff uh, way more than I am because I haven't been working on it at all. <laughs> but uh, I do think she's going to be someone to look out for in the near future because uh, okay. she's really honing her shit down. Okay. What, what's her name again? Rachel? Rachel Rothenberg. Rachel Rothenberg. Okay. And she hosts an online mic, the Panda Mic, just spelled the pandemic with an excl exclamation point. Nice. Uh, so she's been running that all quarantine and doing shows there. So. Right. I'm going to plug her, of course. <laughs> well, it's your wife. I would hope you were plugging her. Yeah. That's clean comedy. And I right genuinely there. think she's funny. That's what, like what we connected over. So, you know, it's not like I honestly probably wouldn't even bring it up if I didn't think she was funny. <laughs> oh, God. My, my girlfriend does not do comedy, but now uh, a lot of my female comic friends are like encouraging her and I don't I don't care for it. I don't I, I don't <laughs> I don't want to deal with that competition. Yeah, <laughs> start start having awkward relationship drama because she did better than you on a on a show. Oh yeah, that would be <laughs> or yeah, vice that, versa. <laughs> <laughs> oh god. So, um, what is your literary background? How did you come to discover? In, well, yeah. Well, what's your literary background overall? What are you typically into? How did you come around to uh, Infinite Jest and David Foster Wallace? When did when did that find you? Yeah. So, um, I mean, I grew up. I love reading. Uh, I was kind of a big like Dean Koontz, Stephen King fan in middle school. Uh, and then Dean Koontz kind of fell off because he's not that good of a writer. Uh, but I think Stephen King actually is. Uh, and then, you know, so I, I, that was kind of, those were my favorites back in the day. And then I, um, you know, just continued reading. Vonna gets a, a big favorite, Murakami. Um, so Infinite Jest is just a friend's recommendation. I was living in uh, New Haven, Connecticut for about nine months and uh, was up there on my own. My, my now wife, we were doing a long distance thing. And so I didn't really know anyone. And my friend recommended this huge book. Um, and uh, I had the time because I didn't know anyone there. So uh, I just started reading it there. And um, I kind of, I thought it was a huge slog at first, you know, and my buddy was just like, get to like 400 pages or something, you know, three, 400 pages in and then it'll click. 
and he was right for me from my perspective you know uh i, I definitely it's become one of my favorite books um i've read it almost twice. i said twice but I've, I'm, i haven't quite finished the second read uh so i'm probably gonna just start over at some point but i do i do agree with someone i think you mentioned on the previous podcast about reading it twice mm -hmm. um i do kind of agree that it is worth reading a second time maybe not right away for the sake of the podcast maybe but uh I, it was basically a different book to me second time around when i restarted because so many mm -hmm. details you just like you're like oh now i know what they're talking about here you know okay. so I, I made connections that made it like i thought it was a more fun read than the first read okay see i know i'm gonna have to at some point i i think what's gonna happen is we only have like 11 or 12 more episodes of this i think i'm going to do like a round table discussion after of just the whole thing i'm going to do the continuation of the podcast which i'm not announcing it and then randomly in there i'll probably drop like a second read which i'll do in like three episodes maybe yeah. I'm, sure, I'm sure I'm going to skim. I, I, I could not. Uh, there's just, there's so much. Again, th this is my issue. It feels like there's so much in here that does not need to be in here. And I know some people like it, but for me, just, uh, I don't know. Yeah. A, a I think too much detail. Yeah. And I think that's true too. And I think there's definitely that, but I also think the second read went a lot faster because, uh -huh. you know, you, because some of the things that are like confusing or like, why is this here? Some of that is on the second read, you're like, oh, now I see why this is here. I'm making these connections and I'm getting through it quicker, right? Um, there, there's, still, there's still extraneous stuff and I think that is on purpose, obviously, but um, like, especially considering he had like 500 more pages, you know, that he edited out and he wanted it to be kind of like a treasure hunt, I think, is there like any, you talked about. Is the information out there as to what was in those extra pages that the editor took out? I haven't found much. I think there's little bits here and there of things people have heard. And mm -hmm. um, I, I haven't really found much, to be honest. So okay. I, I'd have to imagine that would be like a holy grail to like a, a major DFW fan. It just no one's yeah. out there. I think there's stuff like there's like a David Foster Wallace ar archive somewhere in maybe in Arizona. I forget where. And I, th I think I read an article about someone looking through some of that stuff and finding interesting things and like, more more so his like books that he owned and his like writing in the margins like his notes in those books that he owned and stuff like that less about this book and you know mm. uh but there, it might be out there i just haven't seen it yeah because i am interested in how big very big uh, part of the reason i've never tried to write anything like you know comedy if you write one theme that lasts for like 15 minutes that's incredibly long to keep one topic yeah and books just seem like such a long, long thing to me, but I'm so fat. Like I was watching something the other day that was doing a breakdown of uh, the Lord of the Rings trilogy and somebody made the interesting point. There's the character Tom Bombadil, who is so confusing in the original that like they didn't even try to adapt him into the movies. And this person just made their case that like, th this feels like somebody, this feels like a character that made a lot of sense in an earlier draft that just like found his way into the finished product, despite the fact that he just kind of like throws everything off. Like he maybe should have just removed it, but forgot or something. Uh, it, 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 it seemed like he was probably a fan of the character. So just like left it in there, even though the flow is really like, like literally the whole plot stops as they just talk to this weirdo for 30 pages. Yeah, <laughs> and, then, and then he only comes up for a sentence again in the entire three books afterwards. So. Yeah, I haven't read those since I was a kid, so it's hard to say. I, but I do get what you're saying about the book love because I do my, my comedy is mostly like one-liners, except for improv stuff. So, mm. like if I write, I'm actually, you know, I get happy if I write a, a joke in fewer words. You know, mm -hmm. like that's the goal in a lot of ways. So, uh, so to write something like this is insane to me, <laughs> even though I I like it a lot. Mm -hmm. But okay, all right. So let's uh, dive into the notes this week. Again, those of sure. you reading along, it's 6.20 to 6.51. Oh, can I say one more thing, actually, before we get into the notes? No. Is that cool? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> Just that I think, you know, one thing, because we were talking about the length and, and what it's doing, and, I, you know, it's talked about as a postmodern novel. But in my view, I think, and again, some of my views are, like, going through periods of obsession where I'm reading a lot of online kind of discussion about this. They're not all my own kind of unique views. But... One thing I've kind of come to looking at that is I kind of look at this as like a parody of a postmodern novel, if that makes sense. Okay. Like 
it's kind of, I mean, it is a, it's referencing I mean, a joke, but I think like he's, I, I, I've literally had people tell me like, well, actually it's a post postmodern novel. Like that doesn't mean anything. You're not telling me anything. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think of it like, so like a postmodern novel is long and there's like, the, there's no truth, right? It's kind of a lot of postmodern stuff is like, like there is no truth to be found in all of this, right? right. Denying, Whereas I, denying objective truth and uh, embracing relativism, I guess. Yeah. And like the death of the author, the, the author's right. intent doesn't matter, all this kind of stuff. Whereas I think this is kind of like the format of a postmodern novel, but there is truth to be found in the sense of like, there is like, I think you can, with enough research into it, which no one, not many people are going to do, there are like things you can point to as like, this is actually what happened, even though it's shaded by all these kind of like character perspectives and things. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there is like a definitive what happened that happens. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it is kind of a parody of the death of the author idea. Like, I think there is one narrator and I think that it, it is directly kind of a parody of that idea of the death of the author. And I don't want, I don't want to say more than that too, because I don't want to spoil stuff you're going to come to, but I think that's just some overall thoughts I have about the book. I wanted okay. to get in here. I'm really, I'm really intrigued by that notion. So definitely uh, if we do the round table on, um, <clears throat> on a wrap up episode, I definitely like to have you back to discuss that because yeah, I'm, I'm real, I'm real curious how this is going to go. And I actually have a note about something specific that happens in here. That's, been a little bit ambiguous i have my own interpretation but we'll we'll get to that here. all right Stop. uh starting off we have lots of specs on an interlace viewer we get the information that 50 percent of all bostonian workers and students telecommute from their home so everybody at home let's all say it together wow the future is just like infinite jest <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, I, I i did shit on that concept a lot just because uh Initially, when I first started seeing that online, it's like, okay, people are trying really, really hard to make like, uh, he was so prescient about everything. But then some of them like, okay, he was pretty good on that one. Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll give him that. Um, yeah. To say this is bad is to reveal yourself as a granola munching hippie Luddite who brags about not having a TV. This nature of watching whatever you want whenever has made real life entertainment almost compulsively fetishistic. Street musicians now drive expensive foreign cars, for example. The slightest public spectacle of a fight or fire or car crash attracts crowds so quickly they seem liquid. Even the annual draining and scrub brushing of a duck pond draws gawkers, including James O. Incandenza, who never missed it every year. It, now, I actually can't put together where they are in the scenario they're describing, because we mentioned there's a duck pond, and James Incandenza uh -huh. used to go there. Because they throw the little thing like Rodney Tyne and Hugh Steeply sitting in drag in a conference room. But it's not crystal clear. Like, it almost seemed like it was suggesting it was like a hotel near this area. But I, I don't know. Yeah, I kind of read it as, yeah, they're near this place. They can see the pond, but they're in a building above it. Okay. Right? Because there's that thing, too, where it's like, it's talking about the like the engine you can hear the engines of the planes overhead and the flapping mm. of the flags or whatever but you can't hear it on the ground so i was okay. curious of that i was like where is this pov is this the pov of like tyne in that building he's hearing this stuff or what because it's saying it's telling you this stuff and then it's like but you can't hear any of this on the ground basically right i thought it was weird because but. what else we have is we have the wyyy engineer who uh we've seen a few times now he's had to maintain the show while madame psychosis is away he's been playing her eerie background music to a dead unused microphone and answers the phone taking well wishes and both denying and encouraging rumors of suicide um so the engineer is in this park tanning near the duck pond when an idling van at the top of a hill suddenly opens and a man in a wheelchair comes ripping down the hill at tremendous speed, a cow, I, I, I pictured it like a cow catcher trap. Yeah, yeah. Like the, the trap built into the front of the wheelchair scoops the engineer up and whisks him into another idling van at the bottom of the hill. So that's all we really have there, but it's, it's a nice little action scene. I'm very curious what's going to happen to that fella. Yeah, I love this scene. I, I just think it's so funny. And the build up to it, I kind of like it is a lot of seemingly extraneous stuff, but I like the build up to like all these people around the idea of like people are so entertained at home that they are like they're they're desperate for entertainment live, you know, mm -hmm. which is interesting with now too, of course, reading that again in quarantine is fun. But uh, mm -hmm. I don't think that's a prediction or anything, but it's just interesting like 
that like i'm craving live stuff i would go watch a pool drain or a pond draining right now probably <laughs> so. oh yeah that, no i remember when this uh, was first really going i would go for walks in the neighborhood just for something to do and uh some of the more let's just say kids who were not taking it seriously um they'd be playing basketball at the court near my house and i just sit there and watch them because like i don't have i'm not even much of a sports watcher to begin with but like I just needed something to look like watching them was like watching the 76ers or the Utah jazz play just because yeah, yeah. It's, like, it's live and it's in front of me. <laughs> but um, yeah, there's a, there's a couple of things I loved in this too. Like, well, first of all, that part at the beginning of this section with like the interlace stuff, mm-hmm. that's almost word for word. The same thing that happens on page 60 of the book. They do this thing of like the, the summary of like all the stuff with the interlace cartridge or whatever, uh-huh. uh, which is interesting. And there's a funny thing in there, gluteal hypodeposity, which I looked up and basically just means fat ass. Yeah. <laughs> from like watching cartridges. Um, and then the, uh, the, um, the thing with the, uh, James being a scopophile, getting like, which is like sexual, like basically getting sexual pleasure from watching something. Like he's like the ultimate voyeur in a way. And it's interesting that this, like they talk about how it's always this scene at the pond, but it's kind of in relation to James and Condensen's perspective of like every time he's been there, there's these crowds and there's this stuff. So um, I thought that was kind of interesting. I don't know what it all means, but. Yeah, I'm really, uh, I I, I like the, I, I feel like the wheelchair assassins abducting the engineer is going to indicate that they want something about Madame Psychosis, which I'm particularly interested in because I misread something and made a totally wrong, for whatever reason, I, I, they make a big deal like, oh, Madame Psychosis, uh, Joelle clearly like jumped the line in some variety to get into Ennit. Apparently it's a longer wait oh, than yeah. that. And at the time I just thought like, oh, well she has that relationship to James and Candenza. So that's why. Just because I just swapped in my head for just a second that, in Candenza had the same thing to do with Ennit as he did at Enfield, which he didn't. So mm-hmm. now I really don't know what her issue is. So I'm really curious to see where that goes. Yeah. And I think some of this is like, they're like both the wheelchair assassins and the Onan people are like trying to get at what's going on with the entertainment. Right. And right. that's all connected back to James. So I think uh, they're trying to okay. get the people involved that have any relation to James. So like the engineer has a relation to Joel who has a relation to James. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's my thought. Again, I haven't read this in a while, so I've read this section. I've kind of jumped around a little bit, but well, I we, think we did see, we did see an episode two ago where they were talking about um, getting military volunteers to like watch the entertainment and mm-hmm. describe as long as they could. And pretty much as far as they got, we do know it involves a, a veiled woman in like a revolving door. So maybe there was just enough information out there that they could piece it together. Somebody must know something about Madame Psychosis that, you know, just happens to be another very intriguing woman with a veil that people li- pay attention yeah. to compulsively. Yeah. I also think interesting with this scene, they're doing like the wheelchair assassins doing this while Tyne is watching. Like they're doing this whole crazy thing in direct view of their enemy, which is, which is fun in a way. Uh, but yeah, anyway. Okay. So jumping ahead, uh, 627. This is November 11th, year of the Defend Adult Undergarment, 610 p.m. ETA Dining Hall currently with 133 kids and 10 staff eating supper. If you listen back a few episodes ago, I was very frustrated by the fact that we had uh, Hal and Axford and Pemulus and Kitten Plan all waiting in the office to go see CT, and then we just didn't see them for 150 pages. This is the <laughs> first This is the first we're seeing them after that happened. So, a permanent pro-rector's table, currently seated, has a Syrian satelliter and an enormous woman from Moment Magazine, who we, of course, know is Helen Steeply. Ortho and Hal played three sets together earl- in- earlier in the day off the books in exhibition matches at the insistence of Stitt. Ortho nearly won, a fact that's spreading around the cafeteria, because nobody but John Wayne has been able to beat Hal since he passed his previous plateau. Everyone is exhausted after PM sets and eating to refuel, eating like refugees. Petropolis Khan and Cornspan eat as voraciously as POWs. Pemulus chews with his mouth open, a habit so clearly ingrained in his family that no amount of peer pressure can reform him. The only one not chowing down with gusto is Trevor Axford. A head injury at a young age has now made all food taste like garbage to him. 
Stice continues a story about his parents' meeting in Kansas. There, there was a popular bar game of two people holding a lit cigarette between their touching forearms, playing chicken with who would recoil first. Neither of Stice's parents flinched and both now have scarred forearms to this day to remember the night they fell madly in love with each other to the extent that they have been divorced and remarried four or five times now. Um, wonderful line here. This is the quote. When they were on good domestic terms, they stayed in their bedroom for days of squeaking springs, except for brief sallies out for more beef eater gin or Chinese takeout, <laughs> while the Stice children wandered ghost-like through the house in sagging diapers, subsisting on potato chips. Such a beautiful little image there. Yeah, and the, the, the bag of chips being bigger than them. <laughs> bigger than the kids. It's so funny. Uh, so I had a conversation on my uh, previous podcast, the Magical Misery Tour, where pretty much we would interview comedians, but would it all be about like bad shit that happened to you. Um, I hit on the topic with my friend Ellie, and she immediately one up me. We were just talking about how married couples, and particularly parents when you're a little kid, how they're affectionate with each other. And a lot of people have been like, oh, yeah, I don't even think I ever saw my parents kiss. And in that discussion, I said, like, I feel like I'm going to be a butt-grabbing husband. Like, that's <laughs> it. Even with the kids there, just like, oh, hey, baby, how's it going? And then my friend Ellie, uh, and I probably shouldn't say her name, whatever, she came back with this horrible story of, like, oh, yeah, no, my parents are still, like, madly in love with each other. Like, literally three weeks ago, I caught my dad fingering my mom through her pants on the stairs. Oh, my God. Which <laughs> <laughs> that actually reminds me. So my friend, uh, my friend was telling me, I don't remember if I was there and I, I this is a weird thing with memory. I can't remember if I saw this or remembering my friend's description of it, uh -huh. but I think I was there where I was a sleepover and my, my friend's mom and his stepdad were on the couch. It was late at night and we like walked out to go to the bathroom or something and it wasn't naked, but like she was like patting his penis through his, like <laughs> through his like underwear. It was very strange. Uh, was, anyway, I, but I, I went I'm to, pretty I, sure I saw it. I, I, I went to a funeral once when I was like 17. This was like a second cousin on my stepdad's side. And I do remember like the, the, the widow going up to the guy's corpse and like crying in the casket and just like grabbing his junk voraciously. And I remember <laughs> my mom talking about it on the ride home. She's like, well, she's probably going to miss it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I get that. I mean, there it, it's very yeah. weird, but it's also like, I mean, that's a part of people's lives, their sexual yeah. life, right? People, so. you never know, you never know how you're gonna grieve till you're there. So don't. <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me. Did you see that video online of the guy like like yelling over a corpse at a funeral, and he like slaps the corpse? I did not. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> and people are like screaming. He's just like he's. It's like his enemy or something. He just slaps the dead body right in the face. Wow, it's very weird. But horribly, I have a follow up story to that as well. Um, at my <laughs> at my dad's funeral, uh, my my mom. They hadn't been together in a long time. They're always you know friendly though. My mom had always done a thing to him when she was annoyed with him, where she'd come up to him on the couch and she'd like slap him three times on the forehead. And she did that, like, as we were finishing up the funeral. And I had to tell my mom afterwards, like, yeah, his body's not in great condition. You could have, like, caved his skull in. That really would not have been. Uh, <laughs> oh, man. Morbid, morbid shit. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so what, wait, what did we get up to just now? Sorry, we kind of went on uh, a tangent. We, 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 were, we were talking about the Stice parents being uh, voracious oh, yeah, yeah. lovers and leaving their children to fend for themselves. That's right. That's right. Um, one thing, uh, uh, I don't know if this is before or after that. I love this description of struck, uh, on six twenty nine, And is that after where you just said, um, I am actually, I, I don't think I have a note on struck here. Okay. So, yeah, go for it. Just, just struck keeps both elbows on the table at all times and utensils in his clenched fists, like a parody of a man eating. <laughs> I, just, <laughs> I love that description and just like like you've talked about before like the cartoony nature of this book in a lot of ways mm -hmm. and these kind of descriptions and one thing uh i wanted to bring up from the last section that i missed because it was farther down on my page was the engineer's description of mario did you catch that i did not no where he said talks about the people coming in to to, to ask about 
Madame Sokosis. Okay. He said one hideous little inquirer had 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 a hat with a lens on it and seemed mm. about to fall forward into the engineer's lap. <laughs> and we know he kind of like lists forward and has that right weird contraption. But anyway, yeah. Um, oh, uh, so we have uh, the seven Stice kids, whom the parents refer to as the Brood, were actually better off when the parents were fighting. The mother, known as the Bride, would cook multi-course meals all day long. Stice loves his family and collects stories of them to tell to his ETA friends. Uh, Hal is building some structure with his food. People murmur to each other that perhaps the fallout of Eschaton and a urinalysis has Hal and Axford shaken. So, yeah, we still don't quite get the detail there. Um, Trolsh yep. is going on a rant. Trolsh is convinced and furious that the lunch workers have switched to powdered milk. He, <laughs> recount, he recounts how switching to powdered milk destroyed his family and led to his sister to run away from home. Um, Trolsh, while talking about the overall haphazardness of how the place is run and budgeted, mentions Stice's bed moving, which catches Stice's attention, yelling a says who. So... We've, we're getting a few of these now, but there's been more and more cases, cases of inanimate objects moving around and appearing lately. And some examples of that are Stice's bed um, from the chunk about the only ro remotely romantic experience Mario and Candenza has ever had with Millicent Kent, the husky tripod, which kept shifting around. Um, a grounds crew lawnmower showed up suddenly in the kitchen. And a ball machine, which I didn't quite, I, I think they're talking about the thing that automatically shoots the tennis yeah, balls. Yeah, I think so, yeah. yeah. Uh, turned up in the girl's sauna. Everyone's kind of creeped out about it because there's nothing prankish about it. It's just kind of unsettling. So I don't know what's happening there. I'm wondering if it has something to do with, um, they hinted at something before where they were talking about the constant toxification and uh, cleansing that's happening in the concavity. And they might have hinted at something in there where it seems like time itself might actually be running strangely inside <laughs> those areas. And we do know that these people are in Massachusetts, and the, that area is not that far off. So I'm, I'm yeah. getting a feeling like there might be an encroaching, kind of like nature taking back over, only in this case a steroid-fueled, hideous monster of nature, maybe creeping on the edges. Yeah, I definitely think you know, we know what they're close because we have those things of like them catapulting the garbage into the concavity, yeah. right? Like, <laughs> which, I, which is funny to me. Uh, and yeah, and, and there's definitely, I think there's definitely something going on with these things moving around. Um, and I think there's kind of more on that that comes up uh, as you might expect, but, or maybe not with this book because sometimes stuff seemingly gets left behind. But yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that's all really interesting. I think it's interesting because it doesn't really get into how Trollsh knows that, right? right? I don't think in this section uh, at all. And so like Stice being, seeing that is, is kind of interesting. Like how did Trollsh know? Did, did someone else see it? Did Stice talk to someone? Did Trollsh talk to someone who he talked to? Like, I don't know. Mm. Uh, but yeah, that all this stuff is happening and it's not even funny. It's not a prank. It's just right. <laughs> very strange. Mm. And the squeegees on the wall, too, with right. no apparent I, way that, of that fixing them. That was the detail them. I forgot. Yeah, they just found themselves on the wall somehow, and nobody's really... So, okay, th this one is a little less disconcerting. Um, my, my friend Neil, who was on one of the footnote episodes, he lives in a not great chunk of North Philly, but uh, one day there was just a burned-out pickup truck on his block. Like, just there. Like, it, it's not like it had been <laughs> on fire the night before, or anything just one day there was a completely burnt to a crisp pickup truck just right there on his block and nobody knew where and it was like I said, there was just something uncom uncomfortable about it there's no garages near there it's like it almost would have been better had it been lit on fire there because at least you knew why yeah but it just showed up out of nowhere exactly just like a yeah. ghost and then one day like a ghost it was just gone as randomly as it came yeah and i think that yeah that the ghost thing I think is relevant here, uh, potentially, uh, <laughs> oh, okay. but, okay. um, well, we know there's, go I mean, we had the thing with the, the anti guy and mm -hmm. his soul going out over back to Canada or whatever. Yeah, so I I'm still waiting for more on top of that. Um, I, I don't think I'm spoiling enough. I, somebody spoiled to me that there's a wraith coming up mm -hmm. and that wraith may or may not be James and Ken a senior. So I guess there could be something of, you know, he would go back to where he held domain and 
messing around with shit. I don't know. We'll yeah. I well, mean, I think it's interesting too. This section, like it talks about this stuff has been happening for a couple months now. Uh, right. Like it's, and it's slowly building up. Right. As you know, as the kind of action of the novel is, is kind of reaching its climax, I guess, but that, that these things is like keep happening over the last few months uh, with no apparent explanation. And I don't think it ever gets into like a very, um, explicit explanation, but I do think. Yeah, I don't think we're gonna relevant. get a whole lot of the how about it, but I'm okay with that. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, but yeah, I won't say any more about the the ghosts here. Okay. But <laughs> um, so. I did love the line: "Your your fucking head is a minute grain trollsh when he's talking <laughs> about the powdered milk. And I do. I, I'll, I'll just jump ahead and mention the fact that I I do love that after all this powdered milk talk. Uh, Hal just kind of thinks to himself, like, "Oh yeah, no, it's been powdered milk for like five years." Like, yeah, they've years. known this all along. Him yeah. and him and Mario, <laughs> as opposed to the trolls, it's like they just did this to us recently. Like, you've been drinking powdered milk for years, buddy. But yeah, <laughs> and that's because CT doesn't want them to have animal fat or whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Hal recalls to himself. Yeah, Hal recalls to himself Oren's obsession with taking girls out on dates. And then doing everything possible to meet and convince a second girl to have covert public sex with him while out on the date with the first girl. This was after his true love and the mad stork's muse was horribly disfigured. Oren kept track of his subjects in written form somewhere between a chart, a chart and a journal that he'd just leave out begging to be read. This is back when Oren was content to have sex, content to have sex with them without having the need to have them fall so terribly in love with him they'd never want anyone else. So I just have a little note here because I've read a lot online with people being a little uncertain whether uh, – I feel like they've been kind of ambiguous with what happened to Joelle, with Joelle herself even saying, like, I was too beautiful, so I had to hide it behind a veil. But I heard other things that there was something with her getting acid thrown on her. I think this kind of solidifies that the acid thing is real because – just because it – how should know about it? Mm -hmm. Like – I mean, I guess it's possible it could have had some Orin could have made it up and Hal would just repeat it. But I, I don't know. This seems a very strange detail for Hal to think to himself that he wouldn't know about that yeah. Joel's mother threw acid in her face. So yeah, that that happened already, right? That's in something you've already read, the acid thing, right? Uh, it, it's been it, it's been discussed, but it's been a lot of like, like third person. Well, no, I think she actually says it specifically to Gately, but she's been kind of like back and forth with what she said to Gately. So you're not kind of sure what's true and what's not. Yeah, yeah. Because I think I think there's a section, and I think I feel like you might have already been it, but the person that tells the story about the acid isn't Joel. I think. Okay. I th I feel like it's like Gompert or somebody or someone telling it to someone else. I can't remember. Okay. Um, but I think I think the thing is it's unclear whether it happened or not because like there's unreliable narrators throughout this thing mm -hmm. and like people lying and stuff. So like, I think the acid thing definitely happened, but whether or not it actually hit Joel is, is mm -hmm. kind of questionable and whether or not her like you hid stuff is, is more of a personal thing. Like, like I don't think there's a mystical, like she's so beautiful that really like anything going on there, like fully mystical, but I think her own perception of herself and her interactions with men and stuff potentially led her to that. Or she was disfigured. I think, I think that's like not confirmed either way, in my opinion, uh, okay. because of how the information gets there, you know, uh, okay. through the different narrators, but right, I'm going to have to uh, wait and see more from the narrators. And I just thought something I I've seen that a few times in a few different novels where like a controversial piece where like that was a little bit ambiguous gets confirmed by like a side character who had nothing to do with it but yeah it, very much like this like well that person has no stake in the game but, yeah again, or maybe it was molly notkin i think and she's like being interviewed at some point right Mel molly notkin i think oh, that I, happened before I, I actually don't think we've seen molly notkin since uh since the od at her party i don't think i actually wait was it okay did they that might be her? coming up okay or, that might be coming up all right it might have happened. It might be. I don't know. Who knows this book sometimes at the time. Like after this, all this we've just read, I just looked ahead a little bit and you get like the actual match that they're talking about in this section while they're eating right. later that, you know, cause it happened the way this book is set up. But, right. um, but yeah, so I think anyway, the point with Joel is like, I think it's kind of unclear and maybe it is in there definitively in some way. And I just haven't gotten that detail myself from reading I'll it. Let, but. I'll let you know if I find it. 
Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll keep listening. I love your podcast, by the way. I didn't say this at the top, but thank you, man. I've, been, I've been, I've been a fan since I heard about it. So, Oh, dude, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate that. Um, where are we at? Oh, okay. So we have a little, little talk about sex. Uh, struck, Pemulus, Stacked, and Freer have all had sex before. Hal is the only male ETA student whose goal is to be a lifelong virgin. He feels Oren is having enough acrobatic sex for the, to make up for the, uh, uh, the other Incandenza boys. Hal is pondering his match with Stice because he believes Stice should have beaten him, but only didn't because Stice didn't believe enough in his own ability. He's an all-new, all-sober Hal now, which nobody else is yet aware of. So we're getting a little bit inside Hal's head that he's sober for the first time in a long time. Clearly, actually, I just realized with the timeline, I really don't know what's going on there. I don't know if, uh... okay, no, he must be newly sober on account of the urinalysis test. Because this is only like a day or two after Eschaton, which we know he was like smoking weed at. Yeah. He can't be too far into that right now. Though. Yeah, so I think we're a day or two into him not smoking weed is basically okay. what's happening. And so he's starting to get like the saliva buildup and stuff. Mm-hmm. I think it talks about. Okay. Um, yeah. So we have a Trosh has never come close to dating anybody, though this phenomenon is not unique to ETA. Most academies have their shares of asexuals too emotionally drained by training to have any juice left over for dating. Many guys who go slack and nerveless on the court go pale, white, and tense at the thought of approaching any female socially. Stitt's entire program is about forgetting yourself and being yourself is important to dating. Freer theorizes that most of the female ETA students are unrealized lesbians, noting, and I just love this line here, so I put the quote, uh, Millicent Kent, 16 and phenomenal on incline bench press, with breasts like artillery and a butt like two bulldogs in a bag. <laughs> Very it's so funny. <laughs> and doesn't it say like someone came up with that and everyone like Stice came up with that and everyone oh, yeah, just it is, kept it, it? Yeah, it's just caught on. Yeah. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah. Um, I I love in this section the ongoing joke from Free or from Coil that's like referenced like every few paragraphs with like the yeah uh, he, he asks um. <clears throat> Surely they've heard the one about what do Canadian girls put behind their ears to attract boys. And then you don't hear about it. And then he just yeah. like, their ankles. And everyone ignores him. And then a few <laughs> paragraphs later, he explains the joke. <laughs> in just one little thing. And I just love that, like that, that joke over, like it's happening pretty fast, but there's all this detail in between, I guess. And that uh, like Freer has a poster of basically like a gynecological tool this uh, culposcope, a souvenir culposcope, which is, I guess, a, <laughs> something used in gynecological exams to like view the cervix and stuff, uh, which is like very bizarre. Yeah. Um, but, okay. uh, we have the bit on the milk here. Hal and Mario both know the milk has been pre-mixed powdered milk for years, even before CT's administration. The kitchen pre-strains it in industrial mixers every night. Noting that most people's aversion to powdered milk is merely the concept and not actually the taste. Um, the joke around ETA is that Stice has no fear of heights, but a fear of weights. He'd had a traumatic <laughs> experience at 14 where he'd set a pull-down bar too high and upon attempting it was traumatized by instead lifting himself up off the ground rather than the weight down. Enough that Dr. Rusk has given him a medical pass not to lift weights. <laughs> I, do, I do just like the concept of that. Like, oh no, I don't have a fear of heights. I have a fear of weights. Yeah, that's it's just a silly joke in there. But I, I wasn't there something with him talking to Lyle or Rusk about it earlier. This yeah, thing he and like about it a few times, and that's Lyle's uh, go-to grab bag of uh, solipsisms. One of them is do not let the weight you try to pull to yourself overweigh your yeah. own weight. And then we had that thing with the barrel earlier, with the bricks uh, oh, way earlier. Yeah. Mm. The, that whole kind of funny scene. Um, one thing I just I realized we kind of passed over is a small detail, but I think is kind of relevant. Mm. Uh, on thirty six thirty three to six thirty four is Clinette, the uh, one of the workers at ETA that lives at Ennett House, and we've heard a little bit from Clinette before uh, in small parts. I think some in the Wardeen section and, uh, some in some of the edit section, but she's going home with a backpack full of stuff. Oh yeah. Yeah. ETA. yeah. And I think there's some cartridges potentially in there. I think there's something with Colinette and moving cartridges around 
that comes up. Okay. Yeah. Um, they, they give a brief description. It, pretty much just the standard, like, yeah, if you come there and work, it's not really necessarily allowed or frowned upon, but it's kind of accepted. Like you're going to take some food back with you. You're going to take some utensils, etc. Yeah. And some other things might find their way in there. That'll be pertinent to the plot. Yeah. So I think Clinette has something to do with moving cartridges around, I think mm -hmm. from, from reading this before, but, uh, and some stuff we've already read, but, okay. um, and then, uh, what was I going to say? Yeah. Anyway. That's all right. So, the next chunk we have here is uh, we're going to learn about, about Steeply Senior. So we're going back in time for a bit. We're back in May 1st, year dependent adult undergarment on the burning edge of Tucson with Steeply and Marath. Steeply recounts how his father was taken in by a different entertainment, the television show MASH. How he'd always be home promptly at 8.50 on Thursday nights and would always eat his dinner watching MASH. Uh, Mummykins, his pet name for his mother, used to tease him, thinking it was adorable. Steeply figured his dad worked hard enough that he'd earned an innocent obsession. Marath lets Steeply slide on the terms Mummykins, but does add cuteness in fathers. This is rare. I love that line. Uh, Steeply notes his father worked for a home heating oil business, dropping the notion that M. Fortier and his files have certainly informed Marath of this by now. Steeply notes the, troubled, the trouble started when MASH started running in syndication. Now, those of you who don't know, syndication is pretty much, you know, you have like your local channels, your, CB, your CBS, your ABC, your NBC. Uh, syndication is when those networks are, I'm trying to think of the way to word this, more or less like, okay, when, when, you, see, when you see Seinfeld airing on Fox, when it originally aired on NBC, that is the local affiliate who have bought the rights to view those films. Uh, God, bought the rights to air those shows during because, like, the actual thing you know of is like NBC, CBS, the national one that like airs Saturday Night Live and shit. That only runs from like eight to eleven o'clock at night, and then whatever duration the Today Show is. Everything else is the local syndicate's decision, and that's where they decide to air, like, you know. Uh, Ellen, which is a syndicated show that has to be bought individually that's not produced by a network. I don't know if any of this is important, but the, the overall thing is now MASH is on multiple times a day. So there's still new episode airing, but uh, yeah, now there's all these reruns, and this messes up Steeply Senior, who begins keeping a small TV at work to catch the show. He quits his bowling team and the Knights of Columbus to watch the show at every opportunity. The cuteness was gone. He'd sit hunched, not even eating off his TV tray, staring agog at the TV screen. Marath sympathizes, having seen a brother take the same posture for hockey games. It took, a darker, yeah, it took a darker turn as Senior began keeping a notebook to keep track. And we need to take a pause here because in this section we have our word of the week. Oh, boy. I didn't inform you of any of this because I only find it when I go. We have a German compound word. It is Bracken Gespenstfanum. <laughs> Use here in the term, there would be no titanic or menacing Bracken Gespenstfanum with the sunrise of dawn. This is a, <laughs> this is a German word. Bracken Gespenst translates to Bracken Specter which is a magnified, enormous shadow halo of a sun casting against an object. So if you're like walking in the desert and see the sun rising behind a mountain and you see a, a halo effect coming off it, that is a Brocken Gespenst. And Phantom, as far as I can tell, doesn't translate to anything. But <laughs> Brocken Gespenst does. So there we go. We have our word of the week, Brocken Gespenst Phantom. I don't know. <laughs> Try to try to use it in a sense. That yeah, right. <laughs> okay. I'll just say big shadow. <laughs> Look at that big shadow there. there. Um, Steeply Senior began using quotes from Mash to make points in daily conversation. His wife often had to feign illness to skip appointments and dinner dates if the show were on at the same time. He began being unable to talk about anything but the show. Uh, began sleeping in the bedding room. Well. I mean, sleeping in the living room while moving his bedding as he had actually stopped sleeping in order to watch and taping videos onto Betamax. He'd stopped coming into work. Even, uh, Steeply even found letters his father had written to fictional characters on the show. 
Steepley's boss, Mo Cheery, came to watch episodes with him and then pulled aside Mrs. Steepley to tell her that he seriously needed help, where Muminsky just pretended she was oblivious to any problem. Pop starts to concoct theories about the fictional character he was writing to, Burns, as a message about the apocalypse burning the world. Every time an actor or character left the show, Senior had a wide-ranging, complex theories on what the show really meant by this change. He began to share these theories with anyone who'd call into the heating oil business whether he, when, whenever he actually bothered to come in. But let me just wrap up this little thing here just because this is one big story. Then a double blow. One, the letters, he, letters, the letters he'd been writing had also been mailed to the TV network who now sent him back a threatening legal letter, threatening legal action due to several threats in the notes. And two, the impending uh, end of the MASH series in 1983. Maminsky tried to prepare him for the end. He refused to leave the den after, not even for the bathroom. Steeply and his sister were preparing to go around mummykins to get the old man help when he died a week before his birthday in his easy chair. Ironically, he died watching an episode where Alan Alda's Hawkeye character thinks he's losing his mind before going to see a psychological specialist. Yikes. So. <laughs> Oh, and the, the fun little thing here is Maraith notes like, oh, your father died of the ent entertainment, only for Steeply to immediately contradict himself and said, oh, no, it was his heart. We got bad yeah. heart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all this and he just died of a heart attack. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah I, this section's fun. I mean, it definitely, I think, parallels, especially by the end, the Erdity section of the, like, mm -hmm. being stuck between two things, right, yeah. and getting stuck in this. I think it's interesting that, like, I mean, it's kind of a meta thing of like, with this book, you're probably taking notes and trying to figure out what the hell's going on. But this guy's doing it for fucking MASH, you know, <laughs> like like a, sit, a silly sitcom. <laughs> um, but also like that, the idea, which I think is common now, of like I know people who like talk in like the office quotes or like, you know, oh, like God, their favorite yeah. television programs, they're just quoting all the time. There's not some deep like, you know, conspiracy thing they're thinking like this guy, but like just well, the let, idea let me, of... Let, let me give you this real quick, because this always infuriated me as a comedian, when if you've been around like non-comedian friends and they talk about, oh, you need to meet my friend such and such. He's hilarious. <laughs> and then you meet this person and they speak entirely in quotes that other more clever people have written. Yeah, it's just like, oh, everything that's funny about you is from Step Brothers. <laughs> like, yeah, like, oh, yeah, I saw that Rick and Morty, too. I didn't build my entire personality around it, but you, you do you. Yeah, I definitely, I mean, I've definitely been guilty of that probably when I was younger too, before doing comedy stuff of just like, oh, I'm going to say this funny thing I've already seen, you know, uh, but it is, I do think that is such a common thing in like an entertainment culture, you know, just yeah. like constantly quoting things and finding significance. And I think, I think it's interesting how this kind of like, this predates like Lost and stuff, but that was like the first show I think where people were like, really like, like, oh, we got to investigate what the hell's going on here and talking about it constantly. And like, well, I, 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 I would definitely say Twin Peaks preceded that. Yeah. It, just, it didn't, la it got worse way quicker. So, yeah. It, but, it, Twin, but Twin Peaks didn't have the internet to like have those convert. Really? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, my friend actually is a big Lynch fan. He's another comedian here. Uh, but he, um, I haven't watched the third season yet, the newer one. But he was saying like that was the favorite like entertainment moment ever is like because those were coming out not all at once like mm -hmm. the online discussions about twin peaks that were in between each week's episode were like oh, some yeah. of the most fun he's had on the internet like well, trying to theorize what's happening but uh, oh god i'm surprised you haven't watched it yet because honestly like even for such an artsy like non-linear show as twin peaks season three is it's it, it's twin peaks only so much more of everything that is uh, everything that made it twin peaksy times a hundred Nice. Yeah, my wife and I were kind of going through slowly the first two seasons again because I haven't watched in a long time. And then we're going to, I think, get Showtime and watch the, the rest. But it one is thing very, uh, it is very important to watch Firewalk with me before you get that. It has a surprising amount to do with the third season. Okay. Yeah, I would definitely rewatch that again, too. Um, one thing in this section, I love this little dumb joke where uh, Steeply's talking about his kid sister and Morath's like, uh, you are not meaning your sister was a goat. <laughs> 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 Just like steeply parsing all this shit is so funny to me. Um, and like wondering if he's like, wow, he's being so, you know, is, does he have an ulterior motive? It seems like he's a kid again. It seems like mm -hmm. he's like, like losing himself in this context that they're in. Like these are two operatives 
Like, is he speaking in code? Is this some elaborate thing I should know? Like, see, but I, that, I, I'm, I'm curious to see how this plays out because it's always read to me that like, Steeply was more the loosey goosey, and Maraith was the one who always had his guard up, which would make it all the better if it turns out Steeply was the one playing him all along. But yeah, and there, yeah, there's that whole like second, third, fourth order. Like, are are they you know like betraying each other? The double, triple, quadruple mm-hmm. agent stuff. But um, it, it would also be a good fake out, just because for the very first time we've seen Steeply, it's been presented as like you know his tits are going in different directions and he's kind of sloppy. So th- yeah. it, it, it would be if he was super. super and maybe spotted. he got it. Maybe he got it better too by the time we see the action in November, since this was May. He might have gotten it down a little more. Who knows? Um, I'm I'm really ca- I I would love to read an analysis on this on what. Foster found so fascinating about the idea of uh, and of course it's harder now because we're living in a reality where that change has already occurred. What is the fascination and more importantly the importance of being able to watch something whenever you want as opposed to being beholden to a pre-running schedule because obviously that's the big it's been stated several times that that's kind of what put regular television out of business was this whole notion like you can watch whatever you want whenever you want and people freaking the fuck out about it and in here we hear a story where it's almost kind of suggested that would have stayed saved steeply's father's life if he because he he threw his whole life into shambles just so he could keep up with the show so because um, of syndication which led to what we see now in this world like that they're kind of i think he's kind of arguing like syndication is the precursor to this unlimited choice Mm. Right, like, because you could watch it on any station at any time at a certain point with this character, at least the way he puts it here. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's just, it's it's a fascination I'm curious about, just because I know in his personal life they said that he was like he'd be the kind of guy who would just like watch television for hours and hours and hours. So clearly, it did something to him personally. Yeah. Yeah, he was a big entertainment fan. Like, he loved action movies. I remember reading something like he loved uh, Broken Arrow, <laughs> which is terrible. See, but I, 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 wish, I, I wish modern snobs would hear shit like that because I, I guarantee a lot of the people who love David Foster Wallace would never watch a dumb action movie to save their lives. Because yeah. I, I feel like that happens a lot with people who are trying hard to live up to some kind of perceived uh, goalpost. Like, I want to be like X- but it, but then they don't take into account like well yeah but guess what trying to live up to X X did none of the stuff you're doing but yet you think you're gonna somehow become that yeah Does that make any sense I don't know yeah I get I get what you're saying this also uh, kind of back to the section but this I think this might be the last on the mountain Marath and Steeply section too yes because that's so. the, it actually ends here where a Marath, well Marath hints through the thing that like I need to be going soon at the very end here, he announces it's time to leave and he would prefer if Steeply left first. Kind of hinting back to, uh, Steeply says, like, they just find themselves on top of this mountain that the wheelchair guys kind of take delight in mystifying. Like, how the hell did he get up here without yeah, addressing yeah. it? That, that also reminds, sorry, this reminds me of a description that I forgot in that first section we read uh, today for this, uh, where the vans are only cleaned halfway up because it's the wheelchair assassins. <laughs> so they only can clean halfway. The rest is all dirty. I just thought that was so funny. I didn't put that together. That's, that's a good little detail. <laughs> um, uh, and, and, one- and this whole section, while Steeply staying it, Brass still got his hand on a gun the whole time. This guy's like opening oh, up yeah. about his traumatic father's death. Uh, and he's just like holding a gun ready to shoot him at any moment throughout this. Uh, I, I so hope Steeply is revealed to be like a master super spy that's just been playing kind of slovenly and dopey this whole time <laughs> um la- last two little notes from that section is uh number one his mention that the whole family has bad hearts i'm hoping is not foreshadowing that we're going to see steeply keel over at some point but it's also noted that in his final days steeply's father had the same empty-eyed expression as uh hank hoin did one of the volunteers after watching the entertainment just the an empty an empty shell of a man looking out yeah and then that whole like misplaced lost thing it's not quite gone it's not quite like he's trying to kind of like describe what that looks like yeah and morass not quite understanding um like 
had not not inanimate stuck not mm -hmm. glued but like trapped between two things which is interesting i have no idea what that means for what the entertainment's doing but <laughs> i just thought that was an interesting detail yeah i'm really uh, i'm i'm gonna jump down the worm i've been avoiding it so far but i'm probably gonna jump down the wormhole of like reddit and shit and really checking out people's theories and analyses yeah i think done and like, there's some stuff that's good. There's uh, people often, I would say some of it don't look at till you're done. There's the guy who started Reddit's like analysis of the whole book, which is like kind of more plot based rather than like thematic. Uh, but I think he, he tries to pull together kind of what happens between the end and the beginning and like um, some of the stuff that's not explicitly said and like putting that together. So, and I think he's got a lot of it right, but he's not quite fully right. Um, and then there's a, uh, so Aaron Schwartz, I think is his name. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's, there's a lot of interesting discussion on like the infinite summer and infinite winter stuff. And again, you got to take everything with a grain of salt because you know, who knows how deeply some of these folks have read it. I do. I've told you about this guy in that, that meme group. Uh, once, I think once you finish, check out some of his stuff or like I, if he's up for it, I would recommend this guy as a, cause he's, he's the one source I've seen where, he brings things together that I've never thought about, but he has evidence to prove it. You know. Wait, wait. wait. Do you know? Do you know that name off the top of your head? Uh, I think it's Tim Eastwood. Tim Eastwood. Okay. Okay. I will actually make a note of that right now. Yeah, I've not, I know nothing about this guy other than his comments on threads in this fucking Hal posting group. Uh, but he's always he's always seemingly on point and seems to have you know put in a lot of work to understand this book and has page references and stuff and like um had a few kind of interactions with him but anyway okay something to think about you know i'll, I'll look into I, i've noticed though that people who tend to take the book very very seriously want nothing to do with this podcast yeah I and that, that may I, be I, the I, case I, I, I don't know i invited on a few people where like okay listen to an episode or two it's really not my thing but yeah and but i do feel like some people maybe it's like once it's because there's some stuff it's just hard to talk about until you've gotten there, you know? Yeah, and just the way that this book releases information, you know? Um, but and that's why I said he might be a good one for the last one, because now you have everything, and he can maybe put, draw some things together that made, might have been missed, which I admit everyone misses. You know, it's not it, there's, very there's, straightforward. There's so much there. You kind of need somebody. He, you do kind of need, like, the cartographer of the group who's going to be keeping intense detail as you go. Yeah. So I find it helpful, but I go through periods of being obsessed. Like right after we talked, I went in and started reading, I read like 60 pages from the beginning of the book again. And like, um, but yeah, once you read it, you can kind of jump in anywhere since the way the time works, but yeah, that, that's, that, that's what I'm hoping. Cause there's parts of this book. I won't mind going back and reading. Like I could honestly see reading through this book and just reading the Gately stuff on a, Oh yeah. The Gately stuff is some of the best and you get, you're going to get back to more of him, obviously. Um, I like going back to stuff like that weird first person narration near the beginning with like the face in the floor. Mm -hmm. And it's so unclear, like who this is, right? Like you think it's Hal almost, but it's not because the way it references anyway, there's some, there's little sections throughout where I'm like, what the fuck? I've read this twice. <laughs> I have no fucking clue what's happening. Uh, and the narration's so weird, but that, you know, that goes into my theory, which I don't want to get more into of the one narrator, but, um, okay. I, 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 did, I did note at one point, I think it was during Eschaton, where um, for, for the footnotes, it was very specifically from Hal's point of view, which is the first time we had any kind of narrator in the footnotes. Yep. And that's like him and Pemulus kind of like Pemulus dictating to Hal, I think, uh -huh. and Hal commenting on the dictation within that of the rules of Eschaton. Right. And yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's fucking the, the narration. In this is very bonkers. So let's plow ahead. Last four pages. Okay. Um, November 13th. So this is two days since we've seen all the kids at Eschaton, at Eschaton, at Enfield. Um, 2.45 a.m. Oh, wait, I'm wrong. This is, this is uh, we're at Ennit. My bad. So. Yeah, and I think this is like two days after, two or three days after the Gately scene that you did last right. episode, I think. So uh, Gompert, Day, Erdity, and Green are in the living room with the lights mostly out. Former cocaine and stimulus addicts can sleep well by month two of sobriety. Alcoholics, month four. Pot and tranquilizer addicts can basically forget about sleep for the first year. The whole house is still exhausted from the gately and lens mayhem in the parking lot last Wednesday night. 
day annoys Gompert with a story about playing violin in an attic with an exhaust fan. And when the frequencies of the violin and fan squeak harmonized, it set off something inside of him, a dark, billowing, shapeless shape in his mind. He ran out of the room scared, then returned out of curiosity, the curiosity of a child fingering a new wound. Same, a psychic horror. This time, it wouldn't go away and wouldn't go away for a year. It would vanish for years at a time until sophomore night, until sophomore year, one night while attending Brown University, it returned with a vengeance and made him want to leap out of a window. Green screams in his sleep something about Mr. Ho. Day said that he felt it was pure hell, but it hasn't returned since. Quote, from that day, I understood on an intuitive level why people killed themselves. If I had to go for any length of time with that feeling, I'd surely kill myself. So that's the end of my notes. So obviously we've, we've heard that notion before, not only in this book, but a lot of uh, Wallace's thoughts on suicide in the past, which obviously, unfortunately, he succumbed to uh, the notion of just like a big gray blob overtaking your life with no escape whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, this section... I think that's interesting that that like kind of bringing about another character's kind of experience with this and kind of trying to identify with uh, Gompert, is it? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think maybe they do identify a little bit. Like there is a little connection there, ultimately, maybe, mm-hmm. of like they kind of get it together. I think that section is interesting where um, like he's talking about uh, the kind of person he doesn't even know anymore that helped him through it and just sat there and they didn't even talk. Mm-hmm. They were just there with him right, to help right. him through it. And I think that's kind of an important thing. And especially I think they, for, they, they even noted like they had no relationship before or afterwards. That was just somebody who was there for him one night and then just went back on with their lives. Yeah. But that was a significant moment in this person's life that helped them get over this thing. Mm-hmm. Just like, just like, and I think that's a, a kind of a thing theme with this book is like the solipsism uh, versus community and like, just like getting out of your own head and having someone there and really truly trying to identify and, and have a human connection that's so hard to do in the society that's like, you know, overrun with distraction and entertainment and stuff, right? So I think, I think that's an important thing that, that will come up later, this idea of like listening and identifying and, and kind of like having a human connection because there's so much miscommunication in this book, you know? And a lot of the stuff is like, right. People not because... Understood. Yeah, or like you'll have whole, there's like, you know, earlier there's like whole conversations where people are saying something like that, you know, Hal and his dad with the conversationalist, but also like, mm. also like the, the ETA kids, they'll just, someone's t- saying something and other people are responding as if they didn't hear anything that person just said, you know? Mm. Uh, and, and Oh yeah, they're like particularly so, the, the, when we, every time we see Hal and Oren, they seem to be carrying simultaneous, yeah. completely different conversations. Yeah, it's very self, like, especially Oren's very self-centered. He's not really caring about what's happening with Hal. He's just trying to get his, uh, get information for himself or like tell his story, but not listen. And I think there's a ton of that. And I think a lot of the stuff too, like, like I think JOI, and I think we've had a lot of this too. Like he's an alcoholic, he's selfish. Um, he, I think he's a call. I think he's almost responsible for like literally everything that happens in this book, like including the geopolitical stuff, because mm-hmm. like he invented, we already have this. I'm not, I don't think I'm spoiling anything where like he invented this annulation and these optics that are like resulted in the stuff in the concavity, you know, oh. and like, and I'm pretty sure that's come up already in like little, little, things. it, it might've been like a little blip, but I didn't yeah. really. Okay. But yeah, again, I was rereading some stuff and I kind of caught these little things from stuff you've already read. But like, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, the annular accident that creates the concavity. Um, he knew Johnny Gentle, like Johnny Gentle commented right. after his death. Mm-hmm. Like, so I think, I think there's like, he's kind of connected to everything in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and because of his alcoholic selfishness and inability to listen to other people is kind of the cause of so many problems in this book, including how like, the main character um, his own son who he can't listen to. See, I'm actually really curious to go back and reread the chapter where he's posing as a professional conversationalist with Hal because that's, that's so early in the book that you don't realize that Hal's not being understood in the very first chapter. It's, yep. It seems like a direct delineation, although clearly if uh, James Sr. is alive, then he then the, the stuff that has happened to Hal has not happened yet. So I'm a little curious. We know Hal has had something yeah. with the mold, but we haven't really seen a lot 
at least not explicitly what exactly happened to him as a result of that. Yeah. So yeah, there's that, yeah, that, that whole section. And I think that's interesting because I think the conversationalist is also like a film of JOIs, right? Right. It's in the yeah. filmography and it's unclear if this is that film or this is the thing that inspired the film. Right. Mm. Uh, there's some speculation that some of the characters names are changed in the filmography. Like I think it might be smother Gill or someone might actually just be Hal. Uh, mm. There's some speculation on that. Um, but yeah, I think in that section, like he's talking to Hal and Hal is clearly responding and saying things out loud. And this is earlier than the end of like the, the year of glad section we know mm-hmm. from the year thing, but, uh, and he's just clearly not listening to him, even though Hal is saying something. Cause I think we know that Hal can communicate with people throughout like the November section, right? Like he's having right. conversations with people and they understand what he's saying. So he's not in this kind of state that he's in, in the year of glad, but He's also like, I think his dad being so selfish is just, is just like not listening. Like it's simple as that. Like he wants to communicate with Hal and he wants Hal to listen to him. Mm. And he says he wants to listen to Hal, but he's not listening at all until, and then it kind of devolves at the end of that. Also that section is interesting with him talking about like the propriatic receptor thing in his brain, mm. which I'm not sure is real or not. That, that, that thing has got me hung up for a long time with yeah. like, like, does he have the entertainment in his head? Like what's happening? Um, it's, it, it sounds a little bit like some spoilers I heard, but again, I don't know. Uh, I'm so curious. I, I want to know. I really do want to know. I just, if I was not doing this podcast, I would absolutely just be skimming to get, to get through this already. Just to yeah. Know. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, yeah, I would love to talk to you some more once you actually get through it all too, for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, just cause like, there's some stuff I, I'm like, so wanting to talk about and I talk about a lot with people who've read it, mm-hmm. but uh, I just don't want to like spoil anything no, else. No, like, de- de- definitely keep, cause I think that mega episode is, I'm probably just going to talk with a bunch of people individually and just put it together into one like mega three or four hour episode and stitch it together. But we'll, we'll see. Oh, yeah. yeah, definitely. I'd be down with that. So yeah. Um, that's it for this week. Yeah, Adam, thank you very much for getting in touch with me. And uh, it's always good to have another comic on here that you can, like, shoot the shit with a little bit. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, that, this was fun. I, sorry, I, I kind of jump around a lot in my thinking about this book, too, just because of the nature of it. Mm-hmm. So I was kind of going back and forth. But uh, it's been fun talking about it, and I appreciate you having me on. Yeah. So uh, once again, if you just give us a quick, where can we find you on social media and what you got going on real quick? Yep. So again, the front row film roast, uh, check that out on Facebook. It's a free show we do online where we're basically just making jokes over movies. We're doing scream Saturday, October 24th. Uh, it'll be on zoom. You can just get a free link. Uh, my Instagram is spooky dudes, D O O D S silly drawings. Uh, and I, you know what? I'll plug, I'll plug my, my infinite jest, dumb twitter that i don't we didn't agree to this adam (laughs) no no, i actually like this this is the uh the despicable me thing the minion yeah so it's basically it's uh it's 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 literal i just start from the beginning of the book and i'm going sentence by sentence putting it uh infinite jest in the format of minions memes uh it's at minfinite jest so infinite jest with an m at the top uh and it's it's very dumb most of them are terrible some of them are pretty funny trying to find unique like minions images to put this book over and the plan is to do the whole book i will never finish it i don't think it's dumb i I think this is the natural conclusion to the entire fandom of infinite jest yeah (laughs) that actually started because we were joking about putting jim carrey quotes as minions memes that was the origin of this and just like anyway it's a whole dumb story that is irrelevant to here so nice all right, well, everybody go check that stuff out. Uh, I'm going to quit recording, but you and I can still chat a little bit. Thanks for coming cool. on, Adam. Thanks. Bye, people.